So let's open in prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, again, we just thank you that we can come together to look at your word and to look at the things that you would have us look at, uh, that you would speak to us personally about. Uh, I love how your word says, you know, your spirit speaks to the churches, but let him have ears here. Uh, one message goes out to the church, but the individual hears a specific message. And so, Father, I pray that the message that everyone needs to hear this morning, including myself, I just pray that it, it be delivered in a, in a way that is important to our lives and it, um, it, it makes an impact on our life. And so, Father, I just thank you for that. I thank you for this opportunity, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm here today with all my idiosyncrasies. I keep getting hearing that, you know, I do these different things that touch my face and my hair. John Dyer told me this morning I rock a lot like this. And, you know, everybody kind of marches to their own drummer. And I've got Stevie Wonder in my head, so I'm doing this. Uh, but, um, you know, this morning our passage, if you want to turn there, is Luke 15, 11 through 24. It's the story of the prodigal son. And I, I thought when I, you know, I was getting ready for this, I thought, you know, this is the kind of message that you normally teach to young people, to kids, and, you know, they're going through life struggles and everything. And, you know, mature church, you, you, you kind of, I, I did, I kind of questioned, should I really teach this? And, and, and God said, uh, you know, you, you give your church way too much credit, Tony. So, uh, but he, he says, you know, there's, there's those that always need to hear the word of God, regardless of what it is. And so, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, absolute favorite stories. Um, I, first time I heard it was from Chuck Farmer. I was a teenager. I was on a canoe trip. He, he was always taking us on canoe trips. And um, I was sitting on the bank of a river, and he taught this passage, and I've heard it taught several times as a salvation passage. Um, you know, as we grow and we learn the Word of God, we realize, you know, we make the corrections, but you know, uh, in defense of Chuck and some of the others, uh, you know, and the, the part where the son turns and goes home and goes back to the father, he offers to work. The father just pours grace all over him. You know, there's a, an Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that you, you don't work for salvation. I give it to you because of my grace. So you could work that in there. But, but over time, we learned that, uh, that this really is, this is a restoration passage. This is a passage where a son leaves the father, comes back to the father, but never stops being a son, and he never stops being the father. And so, uh, I, you know, that's one of the reasons I like this story. Uh, another reason I like this story is because it's a great father and son story, and I love father and son stories. I, I've just, I've, for a long time, since I was a young teenager. Uh, at, when I was, you know, I came into this world, I had two men that could have been my father. Uh, one of them gave me life, and one of them gave me my last name. And yet, they both said, nah, I, I, I'm not going to fill that spot. I, I'm not going to do that. But God, in his graciousness and in his love, he spared me of learning that information until, until it was a point where I could, you know, I could comprehend it and I could understand it. There was something that I think was unusual that happened. I, I may be wrong, but I've been working with kids for a long time, and Something that I, that I still feel is a little unusual, I got saved August 4th, 1971 at a camp in Mississippi that Chuck Farmer and John Dyer put on. And I came home from that camp, and Chuck had a little church at the teen center in Gate City, and I started attending church there. And I, at 14 years old, I absolutely fell in love with the Word of God. I could not get enough of it. The more they taught, the more I wanted I mean, it was just absorbing it like a sponge. John Dyer and Barry Tripp were my Bible teachers, and uh, I just couldn't get enough of it. Uh, and one of the things in that first year that I learned, and I almost hate to use the word learn because that sounds academic, that I came to know is absolute truth. It became very personal and absolute truth to me was that God was my father. God is my father. And... And it became so real. There was a, an instance in my, you know, I went to Woodlaw my freshman, sophomore year. There was this, this guy in my class. The, he was one of the snooty rich kids from the snooty rich area. Uh, at that time, it was Crestwood, believe it or not. And, you know, he was always picking on me and picking at me because of, you know, where I lived and my home life. <clears throat> he had a, even had a snooty name. His name was Stillwell Hunt. 
And who names a kid Stillwell? You know, I always thought Stillwell means I'm going to get beat up at school every day. That's the kind of name that was. And we were in a class our sophomore year. We, I was in a class, and the teacher was going through the role, and she was looking at the names. And in this particular class we had, there was a, a, a lot of kids in there that were children of captains of industry and finance. And, you know, if you're familiar with Woodlawn, the old Mills restaurant, there were, the Mills kid was there. Uh, there was a kid, you know, the teacher was looking at the role, and she says, this name here, says, is that the president? That's, are you related to the president of a SIP code? Yeah, that's my father. This name here, uh, the president of my bank is, that. yeah, that's my father. And she was just going, I mean, there was, there was a, an inordinate amount of people in that class that, that had parents like that. Well, this guy Stillwell, when they were doing that and they were saying that, you know, he says, oh, he sees an opportunity and he says, uh, and he, he yells it across the room so that everybody could hear him and all eyes would turn on me. He said, he said hey, Butler, he says, what's your father do? And the Spirit of God spoke to me and he just said, say this. And I looked at him with all the boldness of a line, and I said, my father is God of the universe. What's your father do? <laughs> and while it was a snappy comeback, it was absolutely true to this day. For, I mean, I truly believe that. So that later on as a young adult, when I found out there's these couple of guys, you know, they rejected you. I thought, you know, good for me. Look who I've got. <laughs> you know, I, I've, got a, I've got a feast in front of me. And you're telling me that, you know, they were going to be a part of your life, but all they had to offer you was a, a rotten apple with a worm in it? I mean, I've got God. He is my father. And so that became so real to me that it, it instilled in me, I love to hear father-son stories. Because I don't think of Dan Butler or, or the other guy. I think of God. That's my father-son story, and that's what I relate to. And so I wanted to talk to you this morning about some lessons I've learned in life that deal with a father-son relationship that come from this, this passage. Uh, life is a school, and our education should only cease at death. Uh, I, see that, I see that clearly in Ron. Ron was talking about an old friend of his yesterday that's in a nursing home, still going, still kicking, still growing, still having ministry. Um, life has its dropouts. Uh, well, excuse me, life is a school that uh, shouldn't, shouldn't cease at, at death. It's a school that takes on many forms. Uh, a school, it, it has its dropouts. We, you know, we have addictions. We have people that are caught up in the things of the world, entertainment. You know, they do this all the time, or they do, you know, they stay in front of a TV. And uh, they, There's emotional issues where they, they, they drop out. Uh, ultimately, drop out is suicide. You know, there's, there's things that takes us out of life and takes us out of the plan of God that people, I wish people could get it. This is our opportunity to have an impact on generations to come. You know, Chuck, John, Barry, they impacted my life. Ron has impacted my life. Who impacted theirs? Who impacted theirs? And so on and so forth. It goes on and on. And we have an opportunity in this life. You know, I've said it before. Our legacy is not our name on a building. Our legacy is that we passed on the Word of God and salvation to the next generation, who passes on to the next generation, so that there's a time where nobody has a clue who I am. Nobody remembers me. You know, we all talk so lovingly about Chuck Farmer, and there's going to come a day where people don't know who he is. You know, who is he? Sometimes I feel like I need to explain who he is. Uh, in life schools, there's three ways of learning. There's education, examples, and experience. I got three E's there, Ron. Uh, education um, involves teachers and different forms of media, mentors, school time, you know, classroom. We, we know what education is. It's where you sit down and somebody teaches you something with the hopes that you grasp it and, and learn it. Uh, examples involves learning from others. One of the things that I learned very, very early in my Christian life, I learned it from some really great men, is that if I'm going to be in ministry, I need to have my wife on board. I need, we need to be a team in ministry. Uh, and I got to see some really great examples of that as a kid growing up. Uh, you know, not only did the guy have ministry to me, but his wife did. The wife loved on me or taught me or whatever. And, and, and God really taught, has taught me that and to the point to where I, you know, I want Sherry in everything that I do. And if she don't necessarily go with me, at least I know she's home praying for me. 
And, you know, young men that are coming up the ministry, and I really feel old saying that, but young men coming up in the ministry, that's a good lesson because if you're going out doing ministry and your wife's not on board, you may call it ministry. She's going to call it neglect. And so that's just one of the examples, but you learn from examples. You watch other people, and, and that's one of the ways we learn. And then there's, there's experience. Uh, experience involves gaining knowledge by doing for oneself. Uh, many say the story of the prodigal son is the education of a sinful life, but I, I also see a lesson in the importance of a relationship with the father. That's, that's what I focus on when I read this passage. The healthiest way to learn about sin is education, right here. This is, if you want to learn about sin, this is the best way to do it, is looking to the Word of God and applying the Word of God you can, and, and seeing the examples of others. You know, you, you always, these big, great missionary teams, they always they travel, or evangelism teams, they always they travel around the country and they put on the concerts and they seem to always have a guy or somebody, a lady, a guy, whatever, that says, you know, I fell in the den of iniquity and I was there and God rescued me and, you know, now I'm here to testify and, and praise God that God did rescue them and now that they are to testify. But, you know, it's, you know I, I was on a bridge and I jumped off the bridge and, for 10 years, it took me to recover from jumping off that bridge, and now I'm here to tell you about it. I'd like to see the guy that says, well, I was on that bridge too, and I watched him jump, and I thought, I'm not going to jump. And so for the last 10 years, while he was recovering, I was having ministry. That would be a great thing that if we could, you know, when Ron or me or Ernie or Al, anybody, when we get in this pulpit, we're not, you know, we're not here to be the, the moral police and you know, tell you to change your life and you need to do this. We're, we, we have learned, don't jump off that bridge. Don't go there. Follow God's way. You know, follow the way that the Lord is. He's saying, you know, my path is easy. Follow my way. Yeah, you can jump off that bridge and yeah, I can rescue you, but don't, don't. You know, we, we've all had experiences where that's true. Um, the saddest way to learn about sin is personal experience. It's the hardest way and is the way of the prodigal son as we see in Luke 15. You know, it's not necessary to get electrocuted to learn about electricity. It's not necessary for a cancer doctor to have cancer in order to treat you. You don't have to experience this stuff. You have to, you know, we just read about it, trust the Lord. We see an example of who somebody that didn't. Uh, and we apply it that way. You know, I, I, I always tried to train David that way. Um, he's in a profession now where he sees a lot of people, sees a lot of examples that hopefully he says, I don't want to do that. I hope I, I'll never do that. Um, the same is true about sin. We do not need to experience sin in order to learn about it. Follow along me as I, as I read Luke 15, 11 through 24. Verse 11 says, and he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth among them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his entire estate with loose living. Now we, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he set him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? And I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. Pay attention to that, by the way. I'll, I'll talk on that in a minute. He said, I will get up and go to my father. And say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was uh, still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran still a long way off. Uh, I'm sorry, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf. Kill it, 
let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he's been found. The prodigal son learned three lessons in the school of life that centered around the misery and deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Encourage each other. You know, I, I, there was a, a, an instance where somebody, you know, took a little jab at me. Just a little jab. just, And I gave him a little jab back. Just a little bit. I mean, it was so little I almost didn't even notice it. And Ron, being my mentor, he pulled me aside and he said, Tony, don't go there. Don't you get into flesh against flesh. You cannot defeat sin with sin. I said, well, I mean, it was so minor, I didn't even notice it. I did. He said, and that's what sin does. It starts out kind of like cancer. I talked about a while ago. Cancer always starts out cellular. And before you know it, it's as big as a grapefruit. And that's how sin starts out. Don't go there. Don't get in the flesh. Don't, you don't need to. It's unnecessary. Always stick to the Word of God. Always stay in the Word of God. Allow the Spirit to lead you. You don't have to do that. Uh, you know, Sherry is great about encouraging me when I, you know, Tony, you, you don't need to do that. You, don't, you shouldn't say that. David has always been good about it. Megan, you know, one, one summer at camp, Megan gave me the look. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I thought only Sherry could give me that look. But it, it, was, it was an encouragement. Yeah, you know, when I hear it, when I sometimes I get a little defensive, but when I stop and I realize they're telling me this in love, they're telling me to, to better me, I take it. I, I realize, yeah, they're right. They're right. Because we, do, we never, ever, never, ever need to attack sin with sin. You know, it's, sometimes we get in a situation where, you know, I just want to, I just want to, they really need to be straightened out. It takes just, it needs a big pile of sin just to set them straight. You know, I need to go and just punch them in the mouth or give them a piece of my mind or whatever. Never, ever go there because it takes off. It starts cellular, and before you knew it, it's a grapefruit. You know, you got a big gourd or something hanging on your face. And so we're, we're to encourage each other. Every If you look and you say, yep, today's day, what it's saying, as long as you call today, today, encourage each other because sin will deceive you. Sin will say, it's okay to go. They need a. No, they don't. No, they don't. And this was one of the lessons that, that the prodigal had to learn. Uh, his first lesson, he learned a lesson about sin and misery. Sin promises life and brings death. This is a lesson. Bur- best learn, as I said, from the Bible, from this book. One doesn't need to practice sin to learn about it. Sin deceives. It starts by promising pleasure. If it wasn't pleasurable, we wouldn't do it. Uh, I, I've, learned a, I've learned a lot of things growing up with Ron, and, and I've learned a lot about sin. Um, you know, David, David was a great kid to be a parent to, still is. And, uh, you know, rarely did I have to David, get in line. But occasionally, you know, David will, you know, don't, don't you trust me? And I would tell him, David, it's not about I don't trust you, it's I don't trust sin. I'll look at sin almost as a living, breathing entity. And when it grabs a hold of you, and it may just have you like this right now, but before long it's got you like this. But when it gets a hold of you or when it gets a hold of anybody, it goes. It goes and grows and glows. And, and sometimes we like it. Sometimes it's one of those that we actually like growing and glowing and growing with until that sin, that pleasure that we're getting out of it all of a sudden turns to pain. Um, It starts with pleasure. Hebrews says that there's pleasure in sin. If there were not pleasure in sin, people wouldn't do it. Uh, And I deal with people that they say, I'm hurting. You know, I'm in pain. Well, let's fix it. I don't want to. I, I need to hurt. I need to be in pain. No, you don't. You need to lay it at the foot, the foot of the cross. You need to lay it at Jesus. You know, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. All ye who are weary and heavy laden, lay it, lay it at my feet. Give it to me. 
uh, Hebrews 11, 24 and 25, the great chapter on the book of heroes, it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. There is pleasure in sin. We know that. We, we know what our area is. That's why we got an area. It's an area that we enjoy, that we like. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not going it, to, it's nothing good is going to come from it. Um, we, had, we used to have a trailer here in the parking lot of the church where we kept all our, our props for a play that we did at that time. Somebody came into our church and stole our trailer. You know, and I, when I saw that, I thought, wow, you came to a church and stole their trailer? But there's something going on in their life that's got them so messed up, you know, they, they've got to sell it and feed an addiction, or maybe they just like stealing. Whatever, whatever it is that, that's got them to that point to where they say, I'm going to go to a church and steal. Or I'm going to, somebody come to my house and stole my, uh, my pressure washer a couple of days ago. So, you know, people do these things because they're either trying to fill the pleasure of maybe they like stealing or maybe they're trying, they need to sell it to fill the pleasure of an addiction that, that they've got. It's, it starts out with pleasure and then it becomes less pleasure and then even more less pleasure and then pain and then more pain and then intense pain. That's how it works. And that's, what, that's one of the lessons that he was finding out. Sin, uh, sin begins with pleasure. Uh, sin promises life but brings death. His father said in verse 24 of this chapter, he says, for my son was dead. It eventually brings death. It brought a separation from his father. And, it, and, his, and then he goes on to say he's alive again when he came home. Sin, sin kills everything in us. It kills the conscience. It kills our intelligence. It kills the will. You know, I talked about somebody stealing the trailer. You got no conscience. You go to a church and you steal a trailer. Well, we got no intelligence. You do realize you steal, you're going to go to jail. You do realize, no, I don't. I didn't think about that. I'm, I'm so arrogant, I don't think I can get caught. I mean, there's an intellectual side to this. Just forget the spiritual side. If you do this, you're going to get caught. You're going to go to jail. Uh, our will. I don't want to do this, but man, I got to do it. This, this thing has got a hold of me, and I just can't beat it. It's, it's, it's stronger than I am. Uh, it, it kills the body eventually. You know, addictions. I've seen a lot of people that eventually just dies because of these addictions they've got. Sin paralyzes us spiritually. When we get into this, and I'm not talking about a personal sin where you're walking down the road, you commit a personal sin, you confess it, and you move on. I'm talking about a lifestyle. But a lifestyle starts with, at a cellular level. It says, not only should, is it okay to go, but I, it, it's needed. It's, it's, it's absolutely needed to go. Well, no, it's not. No, it's never not. It is never. James 1.15 says, when lust, uh, then, then when lust is conceived, it, it gives birth to sin. And sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. You know, it starts with a, and it ends up with a, I'm stealing a trailer from a church. I'm stealing from my neighbors or whoever, whatever. Second lesson that the prodigal learned, sin promises freedom and brings slavery. The prodigal was, son was sick and tired of being at home under another's authority. His attitude was, don't fence me in, don't tie me down. I want to have freedom. Uh, there's a famous, uh, well, there's a theologian. I'm not going to say famous. There's a the, uh, an old British theologian named P.T. Forsyth. He said something that, that I, I thought was one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. He said, every man's responsibility is not to find his freedom, but to find his master. Think about that a minute. I mean, there's, there's some groups that, that I speak to, that the last thing they want to hear I, I, you know, a master? Seriously? I, I tried to witness to a young man when, when I was a young man, and I shared the gospel with him, and he said, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting into that. I don't want to be in, uh, beholding to someone. That's how he put it. 
But, but it's, it's every man's responsibility not to find his freedom, to find his master. Uh, everyone has a master, whether you like it or not. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters. You will either hate the one and love the other, or, you will, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You know, that passage doesn't say no man can serve two masters. If you can't pick one to serve, then just don't serve one at all. That's not an option. We're only going to serve one of two, either God or Satan. Now, when you say serve Satan, you know, you think of pentagrams and cloaks and chants and all, but no, serving Satan is when you're not serving God. You could be going through your life just normal, whatever normal means. But you're, serving, you're, you're going to serve one of two masters, absolutely without a doubt. So you better pick who it's going to be. Um, there must be some power to control our lives, and the master will choose, uh, and the master you choose uh, will determine the life that you live, that we live. Satan's lie is that we can run our own lives. We can be totally independent. That was the lie that he fed Eve in the garden. For God, He said in Genesis 3, For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. The great lie is man can be like God. Uh, that's the story of the last half of Romans 1. They worshiped the creature rather than the creator. They were, they were enlightened. But look at what cost. You know, Satan didn't, to, you know, Satan told a half truth. You would be like God. They were. They saw sin and eat. They saw sin. God, God knew it was there and didn't want to look, up, look upon it. Now they can see it. They were, you know, to be enlightened. I mean, it's not the way to go about it. Sin promises freedom but brings slavery of the worst kind. Sin says, do what you want, enjoy what you want, whenever you want. I used to, uh, we, we used to go to youth detention facilities, or detention facilities in general. And I used to pose a question to them. I would say, uh, this person <clears throat> is locked up all the time. At times they wear chains. They are told what they can do, where they can go, and, and they can't do it on their own. They're told when to eat, when to sleep. And if they try to leave without permission, it's called escaping. I said, am I describing a prisoner or a slave? And the kids would start, you know, it's a prisoner. No, it's a slave. No, it's a prisoner, you know. And then finally one kid would, would yell, you know, what is both? He'd actually say both. I like Jeopardy. Do it in the form of a question. But he would say both. And I would say, you're right. I said, you're a prisoner today because you're a slave every day. And you're a slave to sin. And because you're a slave to that sin... You'll always be a prisoner. And that would, that, would, that would touch home with them. It would make sense to them. Sin ignores what God wants you to be, what God wants us to be. Spiritual, uh, spiritual slavery begins with a sense of false freedom, which turns to a little bit of slavery and a little more until completely enslaved by sin. Until you're so caught up in it, you're stealing trailers from a church. You're fill in the blank, whatever that is. I'm just picking on that one because hopefully the person that did it's not in here today. <laughs> the prodigal son was looking for freedom and ended up being told what to do by a bunch of pigs. A, a Jew. He was wanting freedom and, and at the end he's been told what to do by a bunch of pigs. The pigs weren't working for him, he was working for them. He was doing exactly what they, give me food, give me food. Can I, save, can I save some for me? I'm hungry. No, give me all the food. They're pigs. I'm starving to death. I'm going to die. I don't care. Give me that food. You work for me. I don't work for you. That was the situation that he had gotten himself in because he said, I want to be apart from you, Father. I want to go out and do my own thing. I want to go out and live my life in a way that I deem fit. Lesson three, sin promises success, sin promises success and brings failure. The prodigal son says, I don't want to be here. Uh, I don't want to be here at home. I want to be on my own and successful. Sin says, be your own man or woman. It allows you to boast about yourself if no one 
gets it and no one, lets no one else get any credit. You know, he was saying, I'm rich, I'm, I'm big time, I'm big position. and No, you're not, your dad is. You're only that way because of your father. You're, as long as you're in your father, you're that way. You're not that way on your own. You didn't earn that money. You didn't, you didn't you know, build that house. Or Your parents did. Your dad did. God's got a great success formula. This is another one of those things that Ron taught me a long time ago. Matthew 25, 21 says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Servant. Not well done, good and faithful president, boss, chief. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things, and I put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Success starts as a servant. You start out as a servant, God will promote you to be a ruler. Look what he did with, with David. David was herding sheep and wound up herding a nation. Look at Joseph. Joseph became prime minister of, of Egypt. Look at Paul. Look at Timothy. You know, there's a Nehemiah. There's so many examples in the Word of God about what happens when we start out with a servant's attitude. When you learn to take orders, you'll be, you'll be uh, able to give orders. Second thing is you start with a few things and end up with many. I was thinking about, when I was reading this, I was, I was thinking about David. You know, David came through our camp. He was a camper. He aged out. You know, he was a gopher. Then all of a sudden one day he was in charge of all the audiovisual. Now he's running the camp, he and Megan. In fact, they may eventually take it from me. <laughs> I watched them last weekend as they ran that conference, and, and there, was, there was that side of me that says, but I want to do this, but I want to be, be doing this. And then there was a side of me that says, that's what I've been training him for. That's what Sherry and I have been working towards. He started with great joy, and he ended with toil. He wanted to be a big wheel. He wanted to start at the top, give me my stuff so I could walk out here a rich man, and I earned it. And he wound up being a pig servant. He had fine clothes when he was at home. He had fine shoes when he was at home. He was, had food when he was at home, and he had a ring, which represented sonship. And he ended up with nothing. Uh, I find it interesting that he got it all back when he went back home. <clears throat> Sin promises that he would find himself, yet he lost himself. He was beside himself. He was outside himself. Verse 17 says, and he came to himself. He came to himself and he turned back to the Lord. You know, that's repentance. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, for years and years, we've, that's one of the words we've avoided because... Repentance was so uh, misinterpreted. You know, repentance means turn from sin. Repentance does not mean turn from sin. And I called Ron yesterday. I got all excited. Uh, I, I've learned just in the last few days, it doesn't mean turn from anything. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Sin says, go find yourself and live all experiences until you do. You will become more enlightened. Genesis 3, 7, back with the garden. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Is that what you want to happen when you're enlightened? When you're enlightened, they were enlightened, now they're damned to hell. <laughs> because now they, perfect man, has sinned. You know, guess what? You can see naked, you didn't see it before. You can see things now that you didn't see before, but these are not things you wanted to see. This is not a place you wanted to go. In yielding yourself to Christ, you find yourself, your purpose, and your destiny. I, I talk about this all the time. You know, people, the great question that, you know, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? Well, you can find it in a heartbeat to get in the Lord. He'll show exactly what the meaning of life's about. He'll show exactly what your destiny is about. No question of it. 
When, when yielding yourself to sin, you become everybody else. Sin conforms. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may uh, prove what, is the will, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You, you, you bend to the will of sin, you become, you're just one more pathetic sheep following the flock. We are. I'm trying to stop saying you and say, because that, all of us. <clears throat> sin is a factory where everyone comes out to, with the same scars, the same pain, and the same ruin. Christ is the potter that molds us individually through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I talked about that in my prayer. Let the, uh, let the churches, uh, uh, he speaks to the churches and let the individual, he who has ears, let him hear. He gives each individual a message. He tells us, this is your message. I'm, you know, I've said it before, Ron speaks an hour and 20 minutes every Sunday, and it's like five, ten minutes, little segments for everybody in here. You ask everybody, what did you hear today? Something different. Because the Holy Spirit speaks different things to different people. Yeah, his topic was this, it was James. But what, did, what was said to you today? What was said to you? Well, it said this to me. Really? I didn't hear that. I heard this. I didn't hear that. I heard this. Because God speaks to us as on individuals. He speaks to our soul, and he does it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So what did the prodigal son learn? Sin does not keep its promises. Sin's a liar. Lying's a sin. Sin's a liar. Sin is uh, deceitful. In this lesson, we see immaturity, but we all see maturity at work. I want to give him a little credit. The prodigal, the prodigal claimed he was mature all the while focus, uh, choosing immaturity. False marks of maturity are this, is indifference. I don't care what my father thinks. I don't care what you think. I don't care what other people think. I hope we do. We may not like what they think, but if we're going to communicate with them, we've got to hear what they think so that we can... Share, encourage, whatever. Mature people care what others think. He was an independent. Father, give me my inheritance. He should have asked uh, the best way to use his inheritance. Father, you worked hard to give me this. How should I use it? His attitude was, I can hardly wait to get out and do whatever I want. No one can do what they want. They always answer to someone. You've got a master. You may not like it, you've got a master. We all do. It's called, uh, he, he, he was wanting independence, and what he needed was interdependence. It's what, it's what, as a church, that's what we need. We need interdependence. We, we depend on each other. You know, David and Chris and, and Ed, uh, their spiritual gift is musicianship but it's an ability they have, and it aids in our church. It, you know, we, we've all got these, not only do we have a spiritual gift, but we have certain abilities. And these abilities, they make us interdependent of each other. Ernie don't have the gift, the spiritual gift of carpentry, but he's got an ability that, that has aided many of us in here. You know, Ron, Ron does not have the ability to fix a ceiling fan, but it's... It, it's aided me, and I got to minister to Ron by trying to put the thing back together. But he's got a great spiritual gift. But, but we're interdependent. We need each other. We should want each other. We're a church. We're a family. And we all are interwoven. And we all do different things. Yeah, it may not be my gift, but it's an ability that, that lends to our church to make us a better church. That's what he should have wanted was interdependence. He was impatient. He gathered all his belongings and he left. Verses 12 and 13 says, The younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and his in wild living. He was indulgent. He wasted his belongings. He squandered it. So immature. He's not thinking based on what would my father do? What would my father say? I need to ask my father how to go about this. The prodigal son confused popularity with success. 
Popularity is based on reputation. Success is based on character. He was popular while he was wealthy and thought he was successful. Christ was one of the poorest of the poor financially, but people flocked to him because of who he was. The prodigal's immaturity didn't allow him to see the difference between price and value. You know, what's, what's a million-dollar house if it's not a home? What's a $10,000 wedding ring if it's a loveless marriage? Yeah, there's price, but there's value. And he didn't see, the, the prodigal did not see the value of his father. He lost his, he lost his focus on that. Immature tries to be independent while mature understands the need for interdependence because we need each other. Let's look at the two requests that the prodigal made when he, went, when, he, when he left and when he came home. This was a case of immaturity versus maturity. Like I said, he finally pulled it together. In verse 12, he says, Father, give me. In verse 19, he says, Father, make me. This prayer asks the Father to fulfill in me what you want. When I read that and I understood that, I got to thinking, for me, this may not be for everybody, but for me, I I might need to reword how I pray. Not, Father, give me wisdom. Father, make me wise. Not, Father, give me ministry. Father, make me a minister. You know, or, or, or semantics, maybe. But it's about, it's about an attitude. It's not gimme, 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 gimme. But it's, it's make me. Make me in, in your mold. Make me, have me to do your will. Have me to do the things that you want me to do. Because the things that I say I want to do, they may sound great. May sound, you know, they may sound godly. But are they of him? Is it his, is it his will? Is it, is it his spirit driving me? Or... Have I gotten a little big and I thought, you know, I can take it from here, Lord. You, you point me in the right direction. I think I can take it from here. I, I, I know what you want. And all of a sudden, what you call ministry is full of man. What we call ministry is full of man. The prodigal son learned the meaning of misery about sin. He learned a lesson of maturity about himself. And he learned a lesson of grace about his father. As he was going home, his father saw him and ran to him. Uh, and he said, Father, I'll be glad to work for you. No, we don't have any of that. Whew, started throwing grace all over him. Started throwing grace all over him. For the carnal believer, restoration starts uh, involves confession of sin and a repentance which involves the drawing to God and coming home. And I want to explain that. Verse 18 in the story of the prodigal says, I will get up and go to my father. I was reading Romans 2.4. It says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? There are times where repentance is needed, but it's not turning from sin. It's turning to God. And I called Ron yesterday, and I was so excited. I said, that, that little preposition is, is all the difference in the world. It's not from, it's to. The, the prodigal didn't say, I need to turn from all this muck and mire. He said, I need to go to my father. I need to turn to my father. There's times in an unbeliever's life where he needs, he may be in a, in a mindset. It's a changing of mind. It's a changing of attitude. That's what repentance is. I need to adjust my attitude. I'm over here. I need to turn to my father or the unbeliever. You know, it talks about God's fruit. We talk about the fruit. If you look at these items in here, they're, they're the fruit of the spirit in us. They're the fruit of God here. It's, it's uh, uh, kindness, tolerance, patience. These are the things that are attracting that young man back to his father. These are the things that attract the world to the Lord. There's a, a great misconception in Christianity that says the more Christ-like I become, the less attractive I become to the world. And if I were playing Jeopardy, I would, I would ring in and I would say, uh, the question is, <laughs> sorry, Ron, let it dry, it'll flake off. 
the more attractive you become, or the, the more Christ-like we become, the more attractive we become. Look who, look who Christ attracted. The publicans, the tax collectors, the harlots, the lady at the... I mean, the, the list is endless. You didn't attract the religious people. The more religious I become, the less attractive I become. Now, that's true. But the more Christ-like I become, the more attractive. People, want, people flock to Christ. The only time Christ could get the religious people to him is when he was preaching near a big pile of rocks. You know, they, they wanted to, always wanted to stone him, shut him up. And, and when I read this and I was looking at the fruit of God in that particular passage, which we call the fruit of the Spirit in us, you know, kindness, tolerance, patience, when the fruit of the Spirit is produced in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, that's what attracts the world to us. That's what the world sees and says, I want that. You know, a couple of three weeks ago, there was that big march on Washington, you know, about the gun thing. And when I watched it, all I saw was there is a group of people that is hurting like you can begin to imagine. They're crying out. We need help. You know, it's a voice crying in the wilderness. We need help. They don't know what kind of help they need, but they're yelling it. We need help. And I promise you, most of those people, you wouldn't get in here and have somebody listen to somebody in this pulpit. But where you're going to get them is we're going to get them out on the street, and they've got to see this patience, this kindness, this love. That's what's going to attract them. Christ attracted these same people. And when they see that and they say, that's attractive, I want that, that's an adjusting of the attitude. I didn't think I wanted it before, but, you know, I kind of want that. There's a turning of the attitude because... These things bring about repentance. It brings about that changing of the attitude that says, you know, maybe I don't want this. Maybe I do want this. How do I get this? Well, let me tell you. It starts with Christ. It starts with Christ. And from there, that's where we can get them. That's where we can talk to them. We're not going to get them here. Not yet. Some of them, nah. But the vast majority, they're screaming for help. They're hurting, but they don't know what they want. But they want something. And, you know, I, I, I've been thinking, boy, evangelism, it's, it's dying. You know, Chuck told me one time that you're probably going to be the generation that condemns rather than leads people to the Lord. You're going to give them the gospel. They'll reject it, and now they're condemned. Because at some point that's going to happen. You know, at some point we're going to be like uh, uh, the days of Jonah. No, no, I'm sorry, Noah. I didn't think that sounded right. Or, you know, Noah's on record being the worst preacher in the world, 120 years, and all he could get was his family. He couldn't win anybody. There's coming a day in America where, you know, I can give you the gospel, but all it's going to do is condemn you because you're going to reject it. And I hate that, but I don't see that now. I see people out there that are saying, I'm hurting. Please help me. I, I mean, we're begging Washington. To, we're begging somebody to help us. And we've got it. But they've got to see the fruit of the Spirit in us. And they can't do it if we're going, Psst. you know, when the, when the prodigal decided to go home, he didn't say, I need to go home to my brother. His brother was religious. His brother was angry. You know, he left. He went out and, and did all this whatever, was running with scissors or whatever. I stayed here. I was here. I worked. You know, in modern times, I've been in the church. That guy left the church, and you're worried about him. I'm here every Sunday, and I make the coffee and unlock the doors and, you know, sweep the pews, and I'm glad I'm here. No, that's not attractive. That's, that's, that's not what the son wanted. The son wanted to go back to the father because the father had patience, had love, had kindness. That's what caused that son to repent, to turn back to him, to change his attitude. This thing about, you know, it's never about from. It's always about to. You know, I, I told Ron yesterday, I said, nobody, nobody may care but me, but that little preposition clears up so much garbage. Because if you drop from and just have to, you stop all this stuff about turning from this. It's always about turning to the Lord, turning to God. <clears throat> We can't, uh, we can't go down that road. And, I, and I, I'm so thankful that God has given me people like my family and Ron and that 
that care about me, that say, you know, that's not the way. It's not the way. And that's my message today. It's never the way. This guy, he wanted to go out and do a little, and all of a sudden he got knee deep in it. And that's how, that's how it happens. We think we can do a little. The next thing we know, we've got a gun out shooting between the eyes. You know, it's not what it's about. So let us pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we can come here this morning and, and that we all can look at the story of the prodigal, that we can see a, a young man that, yeah, he stepped away from you and he got, he got into the, to the stuff he didn't need to get into, but your character, your qualities is what, drove, what called him back, what drew him back. Uh, and it's, what, it's what's always been attractive to me, that my father is God of the universe that my Father is patient and loving, loves me no matter what, loves me in a way that words can't express. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that has not experienced that love, that today be the day. Today they come to understand that the only way to get that is through the person of Christ. Christ says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And it takes faith in Christ. Christ died on a cross for the sin of the world. They buried his dead body. We celebrated that a couple of weeks ago, but what we celebrated was you raising him from the dead. We have a risen Savior, and our faith in, in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ alone is the only thing that's going to save us, not turning from anything, but going to Christ. Christ will meet us wherever we are, you know, whether it be a Central Baptist Church or a foxhole in Vietnam or a camp in Mississippi, Christ will always meet us where, where we are. And we thank you that, that we have that. I just pray, Father, that you bless the rest of this service today. Be with Ron as he brings the second message. Bless the music as we continue today. Bless this time of fellowship. Pray that we can be an encouragement to each other, that we can become more inter interdependent because of our love for one another and because of our desire to be around each other. I just thank you so much. I love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.